A compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. A forbidden topic of Pushkin's work. When it rains, it pours. Where did it take me? To the regiment and to a remote fortress on the border of the Kyrgyz Kaisak steppes. From The Captain's Daughter by Alexander Pushkin. In a letter to the manager of the third branch about permission to visit places connected with Pugachev's riot rising, Pushkin explained this trip by the necessity to finish the novel with a quotation. Most of the actions took place in Orenburg and Kazan. Did he draw a route for himself? Yes, and here Oralsk is not marked. But Oralsk is not mentioned in the letter either, and in some correspondence neither. Why? Rebellion was senseless and ruthless, and it was a strange story. Why did Pushkin go to Oralsk? Pogachev himself, during interrogation in Orenburg prison, spoke about Kazakhs. He said that he considered Kazakhs as a reserve option. The Kazakhs were on both sides of the camp. He could leave for the Urals or the Kyrgyz steppes. Chapter 1. Why did the poet travel to Urals? He didn't write this book secretly, but nevertheless, following the rules of conspiracy, the name of Pugachev, at least, while working on the story in official correspondence, was rarely mentioned. This topic was closed, the archives were hidden, and there was no access to it. Traveling was unusual from the very beginning. It wasn't the rule of writers of those years to have business trips. In addition, Pushkin went only when the history of Pugachev was almost written. He'd worked two years in the archive beforehand. Pushkin's trip to many contemporaries was absolutely incomprehensible. Why did he travel such a long distance to talk to living eyewitnesses? Or maybe there was another reason, about which Alexander Sergeyevich prudently kept silent. Perhaps, working in the archives, he found some documents and decided to check them, personally visiting the places of the Pugachev region. The popular joke of those times, Pugachev was not the one to be executed. It is not customary to speak out loud about this, but they still discussed it. Alexander Pushkin, on September the 20th, 1833, painted the village of Nizhny Orzesk. He writes, the step, only step around, and not a single hair. A month and a half of autumn road, as he himself said in the country of impassable dirt. The result of the trip were two books, a documentary story of the history of the Pogachev revolt and an artistic story, The Captain's Daughter. Pushkin collected some images for his work and in order to understand to the end who was Pogachev and what Pogachevism was. At Oralsk, Pushkin arrived from Orenburg on September the 21st, presumably accompanied by Vladimir Dahl, Perhaps it was he who advised the poet to go on this trip. Dahl was very interested in local people's legends, and it was just what Pushkin needed. The Belogorsky fortress was located 40 miles from Orenburg. The road ran along the steep bank of the Yaik. The river had not frozen yet, and its leaden waves sadly blackened in monotonous shores. Behind them stretched the Kyrgyz steppes, from the captain's daughter by Pushkin. The Belogorsky Fortress was the fictitious name. According to one of the versions, this is the influence of Oralsk, near which there were the Chalky Mountains. The fortresses were lined up in convenient places and populated mostly by Cossacks. But those who were called to guard duty became inveterate rebels. The uprising that began in our Kazakh steppes just here in Oralsk stirred up the entire Yekaterinburg area. How it began, Kalmyks, they were the Jungars who lived on the banks of the Volga, at the invitation of the Emperor of China, traveled to their historical homeland. It was the command of the Tsarist government of the Urals Cossacks to come out to meet and stop and to prevent it from turning into a huge nomad camp. The Cossacks did not obey. 
A punitive detachment was sent to Yadsk. The Orals wanted to finish the business with peace and the procession with the icons. Women and children went to the talks. It all ended in a bloody slaughter. January 1772, the rebellion was suppressed. The following year, around the same time, when the departure of the Kalmyks began, the Pugachev uprising started. And those who were not executed and not exiled to penal servitude joined Pugachev. Or did Pugachev join the riot? He appeared in Yaitsk at the end of the same year and declared himself Peter III, the husband of Catherine II, who was overthrown by his wife and died under strange circumstances 10 years before the riot. Chapter 2, French nobility with a Turkish accent. A double portrait of international scale, the Pogachov Museum in Uralsk. St. Petersburg artist Bogoslovsky in 1937, almost in the middle of the 20th century, during the restoration, finds Catherine and leaves her there. If further erased, then he would erase Pugachev. It's interesting that Pushkin has two interpretations of Pugachev. One option, charismatic, cruel and magnanimous in the captain's daughter, and the other is dependent and simply cruel. And anyway, maybe some agent of enemy forces. He even offered the army to go to the Turkish Sultan, supposedly he would have a good salary to pay. He persuaded the Cossacks to flee in the region of the Turkish Sultan. That he had 200,000 rubles procured at the frontier and 70,000 worth of goods, and that some guy named Pasha, immediately after their arrival, should give them up to 5 million. In the history of the Pugachev revolt by Pushkin. Pugachev, like a Polish nobleman, and here, he is in the general and Turkish sultan with his feather. The second half of the 18th century, Russia was at war with the Ottoman Empire, supported by France, to which the disorder is profitable. With Pugachev's participation, it took incredible proportions, so that the commander, Suvorov, was removed from the Turkish front and sent to suppress the rebels. After all, in Pugachev's, to some extent, they saw a spy of a Turkish sultan, because he raised an uprising during the war. The Pugachev uprising did not have any similarities in history, not only in Russia, but also in the world. This is the most organized uprising, the most multinational and large scale. And at the head, an illiterate Cossack. But Pugachev, even during interrogations, rejected suspicions of involvement of foreign forces in the riot. Yes, and the Empress Catherine, calling the rebel Marquess, strongly rejected even the idea of foreign interference. It was not profitable for her, and the image of the country after all. And again, secrets. Whom did they execute? There is one very interesting thing. You understand, after all, Pugachev, King Pugachev, when he was being taken to be executed, these are two different people. Even in Pushkin's time, a few decades later, there were tales of Pogachev's escape to the Kyrgyz Kazakh steppes. Money for escape was received from the foreign treasury, and Kazakh sultans helped him too. Chapter 3 Leaving for the Kazakh steppes. Pogachev wrote to the Khan calling himself Tsar Peter III and demanding that his son be taken hostage and a hundred people come to join the troops. Nur Ali Khan offered his services to the authorities of the Yaitsk town. He was thanked and answered that they were hoping to cope with the rebels without his help. From the history of the Pugachev revolt by Pushkin. Nur Ali Khan wrote to the Commandant Simonov a letter if my troops are allowed to cross the Urals, I will give a 10,000-strong horde. I will catch the imposter and give him to you. Simonov, the commandant of the Yaitz town, was simply afraid. First of all, if the troops move to this side, if the Khan passes from this side, robberies will begin. And then he was still afraid. What if Nur Ali Khan joins Pugachev? However, there were a lot of Kazakh soldiers in the army of Pugachev. 
In November 1773, from the middle Jews, 70 Zhigits arrived for the rioters. The sultans of the younger Jews also supported the rebel. He has a manifesto which he sent to Du Sali. The sultan actively supported him. After giving his son Seyd Ali as hostage to Pogachev, and he died in this war. And when already his troops were defeated, Pogachev wanted to go to the Caspian Sea, to Guriev, hoping to somehow get into the Kyrgyz Kaisak steppes, writes Pushkin. But he was captured by his own Cossacks. How dare you, thief, call yourself a sovereign? They asked Pogachev. I'm not a raven, he retorted, playing with words. I'm a crane, and the raven is still flying. From the history of the Pogachev Revolt by Pushkin. When Pugachev was taken to Moscow, he was put in a cage and he looked not in front, but back, that is, towards the road which he left behind him. And so there was a sign, when you leave, you don't turn back. And after the execution of the rebel in autumn of 1775 in the steppe, unrest was triggered by rumors that the self-styled Tsar was alive and collecting another army. It's known that in some legends of the Ural Cossacks, it is said that the real Pugachev was not executed, but as planned, fled to the steppe where he wandered for a long time. They say that Pushkin on his arrival in Uralsk showed to contemporaries of the rebellion a portrait of the real Tsar Peter Fedorovich, whose face did not resemble Pugachev's at all. I heard that in this portrait of the Cossacks recognized the same person who was in Yaith, Vladimir Korolenko, the Pugachev Levin in the level. Maybe Pushkin was just trying to investigate the version of Pugachev's escape and whether the real rebel was executed. But after the death of the poet, nothing like this was found in his papers. However, many records simply disappeared and it is unlikely that the poet, even if he discovered unexpected information, could write about this. Censorship would not allow it. Maybe that's why little is known about his stay in Uralsk. He himself said, the Ural Cossacks welcomed him gloriously, gave him dinner, black caviar on the beach. He remained satisfied with his visit. He met in the old cathedral with the priest Chervyakov. This building is still preserved and asked the priest, how did cruel Pogach treat you? He is Pogach for you, but for us, he's the great Tsar Peter Fedorovich. We have no idea now whether Pushkin traveled to Kazakh nomadic places, what legends he was told there. It's unclear, but somehow Pushkin had the translation of the poem Kosi Korpesh and Bayan Sulu. The text was kept in the poet's archive. The researchers suggest that Pushkin's plans were to create more than one story, the material for which would be the Ural's travels. When he wrote the history of the Pugachev revolt, he sent three books to Artyokov, Perovsky, and Pokatilov in Uralsk. And there were inscriptions that hope we meet again over the steppes, over the Urals, from Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. But the meeting did not happen. Four months after writing the captain's daughter, Pushkin was killed in a duel. Epilogue, an unfinished story. And another strange story. 1964, there's an article about longevous people, and in it, the story about Philip Pugachev who is 100 years old and who lives in the Selinograd region. And, ostensibly, he is the grandson of the rebel, although it is known that two daughters and one son of Pugachev spent almost all their lives in Kexholm prison and they had no children. The best and most durable changes are those that come from one's improvement of morals without any violent upheavals. From Alexander Pushkin's The Captain's Daughter, the story was completed, finished in this house, on October the 19th, 1836. The documentary story of the Pugachev uprising, which contemporaries criticized, Pushkin intended to supplement, but did not have time. And the captain's daughter is still a work of art. The fact that humanity will, mercy will eventually win. 
those who want to start coups in our country do not understand the essence of our people, or they are really thugs and someone else's life for them is worth a penny and his head just half a dozen. From Captain's Daughter by Alexander Pushkin.